Welcome to the Man Cave Podcast with Dan Casper. We're catching up with Dr. Crow, Chippewa Valley Orthopedics and Sports Medicine for another edition of Inside the Training Room. Austin, how are we doing? Beautiful day out there. It is a beautiful day, man. So, hey, I want to lead things off again talking pitchers and, and, and baseball here. So, I mean, that's kind of a common thing right now at this point in time oh you'll have that yeah so uh one of the the youngsters uh for this brewers team robert gasser was placed on the injured list uh, initially uh he said there was some tightness in his elbow and and uh and and like some swelling and such and now they're saying it's a uh uh a left left flexor strain can you explain to us what a what a flexor strain uh it, it actually is yeah, so when you when you look at the elbow, the medial epicondyle, or kind of the knob on the inner part of the elbow, is the origin for all of the muscles that flex the wrist and the finger. So we call it the flexor wad or the flexor origin, um, and kind of generically sometimes just dubbed the flexors. So it's a challenging spot, and I mean, I'm not saying it's not the flexors, but whenever we have that medial side of the elbow pain in throwers, it's you're kind of looking at that, is this some tendonitis of the flexor origin? Is it a strain? And then, of course, sitting right next to that is our good buddy, the UCL or the mm-hmm. Tommy John ligament. So those all come into play. And one one of the thoughts is that sometimes pitchers will have I- issues with the UCL when they have a flexor issue because the, when they when you throw your elbow in that motion, the flexors are, are part of the medial stabilizers. And so if they're not working well, it puts more strain on the UCL ligament. And so whenever we see that in pitchers, we're quick to shut them down because you don't want it to turn into a UCL problem. Um, and you certainly also hope it's not masquerading, you know, a, we call it a flexor, but it's really a, a UCL-based injury. So the hope is that it's just truly flexor. They're probably doing it relatively prophylactically to, to, to let the, that area heal and also avoid extra stress on that ligament. So uh, that potentially could, if, if, they, if he wasn't shut down, if he wasn't getting any rest, it could develop into a UCL, a UCL issue? Yeah. I wouldn't say it would for sure, but it certainly puts you at higher risk because if you, when you're throwing, if you're not using that flexors where you're supposed to, it the, the stress has to go somewhere, and the the dynamic stabilizers of that medial elbow that's the flexors, and if they're not working, more stress has to go to the static stabilizer, which is the UCL. So yeah, it definitely puts more stress on it. Hey, since we're talking about pitching, uh, we actually had a, a texter uh, text us in really quick, uh, Luke saying, "I've always wanted to know this, Doctor Crow. What is the difference?" between a softball pitcher's throw and a baseball pitcher's throw when it comes to harming their arm? That is a good question. Um, we tend to see a lot more elbow issues in overhead throwers, so that's not exclusive to pitching, um, but certainly that's one of the most common things. So what we'll see it in, like, volleyball players, javelin throwers, um, quarterbacks in football. If you watch them in slow motion, as the shoulder comes through, you actually push the elbow forward, and then it kind of flings the ball forward. So it puts a lot of what we call valgus stress, which puts stress on the medial elbow, which is what we were just talking about uh, with Gasser's elbow. Um, now, underhand throwing, so with softball pitching, they don't put nearly as much stress in the elbow. They still do put some. So as the arm comes through, there is medial stress in the elbow, but it's not at the same level. That's why you usually don't see UCL issues um, in throwers uh, – in the softball setting. That being said, it does transfer a little bit more stress to the shoulder. So we do see a lot of shoulder issues in softball pitchers. So, so to answer that question, you know, kind of succinctly, more elbow problems in in overhead throwers, shoulder problems in underhand throwers. Uh, but you can see shoulder problems in both. Uh, so it's not exclusive, but um, it, it definitely is is a little bit more stress transfer to the shoulder versus the elbow. When it comes to a baseball pitcher, what would be maybe a, a, a bigger challenge to come back from? Would it be an elbow injury or a shoulder injury? I, it depends. It can be both. Um, they both can be very challenging. I, I, I would say if I had to pick one, it'd probably be the shoulder um, just because it's a little bit more complex of a joint. There's more mo- range of, ranges of motion and, and planes of motion, um, but they both can be bad bad deals. <laughs> so it really kind of mm-hmm. depends on what you're talking about. So. I mean, a lot of times, and this kind of dovetails in our discussion a second ago, I mean, if we, if we can ever try prevent things, it's way better than treatment. So that's why you see pitchers get put on the injury list so quickly nowadays is because they're like, look, if we can shut this down and nip it now before it becomes a big problem, you're all the better. Obviously, if you, if you never had the problem, you never know if you avoid it or not, but um, it's certainly something that you want to avoid those big problems. So whether that's a UCL injury in the elbow or slap tear in the shoulder, 
um, or like a real bad case of rotator cuff tendonitis, partial tearing, that kind of stuff. Those are really problems that can nag a pitcher a whole season, and they just eventually they wind up heading towards surgery, which is of course what you really don't want to do because operating on a pitcher's shoulder. That is that's that's always a dicey return. Mm-hmm. He's Dr. Crow, Chippewa Valley Orthopedics and Sports Medicine, joining us here this morning. Uh, so last night, NBA Finals, Porzingis uh, returning uh, f- from that calf injury, and I know you and I have kind of talked about this uh, in the past, where different injuries, you know, affect you know for for different sports uh, the the ability to return, right, or the ability mm-hmm. to to do something. And I saw this article in this headline, and I just wanted to get your reaction from it, but uh, it was from uh, sportsskeeda.com. Doctors preview Christophe Persingas' return from a calf injury. Quote, if he were a baseball player, he'd be back already. Exclusive. Uh, and I just kind of had to chuckle at that because, I mean, they make it sound so dramatic like he probably should be back, but really, I mean, that's you're talking about two completely different sports with, with a calf injury there. Yeah, yeah, I mean, there, there's some truth in that, but it's, I mean, it's also like, what, what, why a weird hypothetical? I mean, I don't, mm-hmm. if he was a chess player, he'd have been back right away. I mean, it's like, well, I don't, right, <laughs> you know? <yeah. laughs> so, uh, I, I think, yes, you're right. I mean, the, the level of explosiveness um, in different sports, it's highly variable, and even within a sport, you have different positions that do very different things. So, I think if you look at it with basketball, I mean, those guys are trying to move explosively, jump, quick, rapid change in direction. That puts a lot more stress on ligaments and tendons in the body. So, yeah, you want to make sure you're back. And um, the last thing we want this to turn into is, is a ruptured Achilles tendon. Um, and I'm not saying that would because if it is more muscle-based, then it's probably not a huge risk factor. But, you know, there may be a component of Achilles tendonitis with it as well. And that does predispose you for Achilles problems. So, yeah, I mean, they're going to play it slow, and especially when, um, you know, when you have a team that's, that was working towards the finals. I mean, I, obviously they got pushed by the Knicks, but I think a lot of people were expecting the Celtics to make it to the finals uh, coming from the East. So I think they're probably looking at the long-term gain and saying, look, if we can give them a couple more games of rest, then we'd likely have this big block of time to get this healthy and return for the finals. And it clearly paid off. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. I wanted to get your your thoughts. Uh, I'm sure you heard about this. I think it was about uh, a week or so ago. But there was a report uh, that the NFL Players Association was going to come up with a proposal where we're seeking to maybe alter their off-season workouts to where it was going to be actually a longer training camp. So uh, instead of you know now where they have OTAs and then they have a break and then you got training camp coming up at the end of July, mm-hmm. there was going to be they were going to get rid of OTAs, mini camps start actually up in June and have kind of a ramp-up period and go right into training camp, which to me on the surface kind of seemed like the opposite of what we kind of had been seeing these last few years where they really highlighted rest and rest and, and recovery mm-hmm. over there. Does that kind of surprise you that the players kind of seem like they want to start things up in June and then you go into training camp in July and, and, and not really have a break in between there? Yeah, I mean, I think you know when you look at football, there's there's – Several different types, well, like all sports, but in football specifically, there's several different types of injuries. You have your acute injuries and you have your more kind of chronic overuse. Um, I think if you're looking at the product on the field, I mean, obviously a longer season, we all know early in the year there's more mental mistakes and teams are kind of getting the rookies going. And so there's a, a kind of a growth period. Um, so I guess in that sense, yes, it'd be better. But I, I personally would think that most football players would like a, a gap to like let the body heal up. I mean, we all know f- football is a very physical sport. And so in addition to actual true significant injuries, you have the old bumps and bruises and things that you just time helps heal. So I, I, it was a little surprising to see that. And I do think that there's been a little bit of a mixed response from players. I know some of the players have spoken out against it saying, I don't like that idea. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I, it'll be interesting to see how that plays out. Again, I mean, I, I can see both sides, I guess, but I think from a, from a health standpoint, I personally think a, a rest period makes more sense to me. Um, but, I, you know, then I guess the flip side is, I mean, we also see early in the season some soft tissue injuries. So the, the old hamstrings and mm-hmm. groin strains and calf strains that we do see a relatively high prevalence, so maybe a little bit of a warm-up would help with some of those. But then I think you start getting into more of the contact injuries and then potentially more of like the inflammatory overuse issues. So it would be uh, sometimes you have you know best intentions and all of a sudden you have unintended consequences with that. So I guess it would be interesting to see how it plays out. I think I think again I can see both sides, but um, my, my I would be surprised if that change happens. But I guess time will tell. Right. I know this isn't uh, necessarily in the orthopedic world, but you know staying with with football. I mean, yesterday that scary report about the the Chiefs player who 
uh, suffered a seizure at, at, I think it was in a team meeting, and then he went into cardiac arrest. I saw Tom Pelissero overnight say that he's still unconscious at this point, but he's stable and, and vitals are good. I mean, this is, I think, you know, after DeMar Hamlin, you know, the situation on the field and that too, but uh, I mean, could could seizures lead into to a cardiac arrest like that? Uh, I mean, that is definitely outside my wheelhouse. I'll yeah. say that, but the answer is clearly yes. It happened. <laughs> yeah. I, I, you know, they can. It depends on what the origin of it was, but yeah, I mean, seizures can be very, very dangerous. Um, and so, my guess is he's likely still unconscious because they're he's under heavy sedation, which is one of the things they do to treat seizures, especially when they're in difficulty controlling. When you basically suppress the brain, and that suppressed brain kind of lets it calm down. Um, as far as like the cardiac level to it, I, I guess I don't know for sure. Um, and obviously that's very scary. I mean, you're, mm-hmm. you're talking about life and death stuff. And so hopefully he's still unconscious, not because of the effects of the seizure, um, but because he's under sedation, um, because, you know, prolonged, you know, coma, if you will, after a seizure that can be potentially indicative of, of a brain injury, which can happen with prolonged seizures. So, yeah, seizures are not, I mean, it's not just simply like, a, you know, what we think of as a grand mal seizure, you're on the ground shaking and writhing. Um, you know, that's scary, but it is also very bad and unhealthy for the body. So that's certainly something that hopefully um, is, is appropriately treated and diagnosed and, and they can have full recovery. But yeah, that's, that's scary stuff for sure. Yeah. Uh, last question for you. I forgot to ask you this uh, last week, but uh, back to the Packers here for a second. So, they have a couple of uh, players who are not able to do OTAs because they have pec injuries. Uh, and then, of course, the head coach revealed during the draft he had a pec injury from bench uh, bench pressing and such. So, I mean, we got a strain of pec injuries going on at 1265 Lombardi mm-hmm. Avenue right now, uh, Austin. <laughs> so is that, I mean, for, i, I got to imagine, is that from working out bench pressing? And is that simply as maybe they were putting too much weight, bad form, or is there a lot of variables with, with that? A lot of variables, yeah. I mean, I, I had just had a patient come in this week with one of those. Um, so we see it, and I mean, and he was like all, I mean, 99% of these are bench pressing, I'd say, or darn near. I mean, that's almost universally. And that, they have a, a very similar story. Bench pressing, they'll say it feels like a shirt was ripping or carrying in their armpit, and that's the tendon peeling off the bone. So not oh, exactly a, a That button. just made me it's cringe. Not, it, <laughs> it, it is. I mean, but the interesting thing, it's kind of like the Achilles. I mean, they also present with a very – they always say, like, it feels like someone kicked the back of their leg, and they, they, like, they feel a pop. Both of them aren't horribly painful, which is surprising. Um, but in either event, yeah, I mean, there, it, it, a lot of things go into it. Almost all tendon injuries do have some baseline level of tendon inflammation. So whether it is overuse, going too heavy on the weights, I, I mean, you know, those guys, I, I mean, how many literally probably tens of thousands of times have those guys bench pressed? I mean, NFL players have been bench pressing since they were in junior high. So what made that one bench press different? It's hard to say for sure. So it's, I, I would dub it as a fluke, truthfully. I doubt there's anything that they're doing specifically wrong. Um, is it possible they had a radical change to their bench press weightlifting regimen? I mean, maybe, but um, I think it's more likely you just had a couple guys who probably had a little bit of tendonitis in the pack, went heavy, and then there it went. So it just, it just, I would chalk that up to fluke, frankly. All right, uh, good stuff as always, Doctor Crow inside the training room, Chippewa Valley Orthopedics and Sports Medicine. Appreciate it as always, man. Always appreciate it. You have a you have a fantastic weekend. Okay, and uh, we'll catch up again soon. Absolutely. Take care.